Okay, so moving on, I next have the great pleasure in inviting Mr. Kevin Corville from Prevail Holdings to shed some light on the advanced treatments of cardiology. Please put your hands together for Kevin Corville. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, guys, thank you very much. Um, so we're going to talk, this talk is on advanced cardiology treatment. So we're going to start out by talking about facts, reality, and the future. First of all, I need to lay some groundwork about things. I think I need everybody to appreciate the fact that there are self-driving cars in this world, number one. There's teleconferencing and televideo or video conferencing tools that exist. There are robots that exist. There are drones that exist. There are automated vending machines that exist. AI, deep learning, neural networks all exist and continue to advance. Computers exist, right? Everybody's got a computer. And the final thing that I need to make sure in laying our groundwork is that human emotion is important. Human emotion is important. So I'll start us out talking about this problem. You see, I know this talk is about advanced cardiology treatment, but let me start out by saying the following. Cancer is very expensive. Treatment, diagnostic procedures, surgical procedures, chemotherapeutic agents, they're all very expensive. You put cancer in your mind and you think it's very expensive. Of course, it costs a lot of uh, lives and suffering, but I want to talk about the money. It's very expensive. If you add up all forms of cancer and the expense related to all forms of cancer, they are a mild or a minuscule percentage at the cost of care associated with one DRG in the world, the DRG of congestive heart failure. More money is spent on one DRG in the hospital than all forms of cancer combined. You want to save cash? Fix heart failure. Chronic cardiovascular disease matters. It is a, it's, it's in the fog approaching all individuals. We see it as a provider in this boat be, fixing to be overrun by this freight liner. However, you can put on provider, you could put CEO of a hospital, administrator of a home health agency. You pick the poison and I'll show you the disaster. So we're going to try to do some things today to, do the, to, uh, to rectify some of this, okay? It's not just a United States problem. There are 26 million people on the continent, on the world rather, that have heart failure and it's growing. In 2015, there was a coalition put together by the European governments. They brought in industries, thought leaders, different aspects of medicine. They brought them all into a conference in an international forum because European, the UK specifically, its healthcare system is about to be overwhelmed by the cost of congestive heart failure alone. I think the comment of that was that it's about to break the bank, and that was three years ago. The reality is that about six million or so people in the United States of America have congestive heart failure. Fifteen million have congestive heart failure in Europeans in, in, in Asia. So it's a big problem. We continue to grow. There are 80 million people in the United States of America alone that have some form of heart disease. You want to pick a total addressable market? There you go. Heart disease. Readmission penalties are ridiculous. Uh, hospitals, administrators and systems, and now moving on to home health agencies and assisted living facilities that are also going to bear the burden of readmission penalties are looking for ways to get out. Cost of care currently $70 billion in the United States. That's an understatement. That doesn't include any cost of time away from work, expenditures from families. That costs more along the lines of about $150 million. If I told you right now that all of you in this audience and everybody else in Las Vegas are going to have to pull out a $350 bill out of their wallet and lay it on that table, I'm going to pick it up because that's what it's going to cost you this year to treat everybody else with congestive heart failure, whether you have it or not. $350 bucks from you, your spouse, significant other, and every child you have. $350. I'll be collecting it at the end, by the way. <laughs> it's a big deal. The good news is that we can fix it. One in four of those people that go to the hospital actually are preventable. You can see that this grows exponentially. 
There's a 48% or 46% increase uh, predicted in congestive heart failure alone. I'm not talking about chronic cardiovascular disease. I'm not talking about strokes and stroke prevention. I'm not talking about coronary artery disease, peripheral vascular disease. You can add all of those up and just keep piling them on the back of that. It is an exponential growth. Cardiovascular disease is an exponential growth. If I was an entrepreneur and I wanted to start a company, all I would do is start a company and I would grab the heels of cardiovascular disease because it will take that company exponential whether you like it or not. Why? It's a massive problem. 80% of people, um, of specialists, say that they're at capacity or overwhelmed. 80%. Okay? I'm a heart doctor, board certified interventional cardiologist, as well as uh, advanced heart failure and transplantation. We are overwhelmed. There are 1,009, currently there are 1,009 board certified advanced heart failure doctors in the country. I'm humbled to be one of them. If I started out my day every day, I would have, go to have, to, I would have to go to six and a half hospitals and take care of 6,000 people just to catch up. We cannot do it. We will not do it. It's overrunning us, okay? Half of my colleagues are 56 years or older. Half of all cardiologists are going to retire. Cardiology and medicine is thought of as the professional athlete of medicine. You come in, you bang hard, you build capital, and you roll out of there with a busted back at age of 60. Period. End of story. Okay? So when you say half of them are 56 plus, there's a massive problem heading your way. Currently in the United States of America, by 2020, next year, six months from now, there's a 2,000 cardiology shortage. Estimated 35 to 75,000 specialty uh, 75,000 non-specialty care, uh, non-primary care specialist shortage by 2030, in the next decade. There are not enough specialists. There will be not enough specialists. Currently in the United States of America and across the globe, but specifically the model here is to the United States, although the problem is international. The people who take care of heart failure patients are not heart failure doctors. In fact, 76% of all congestive heart failure in the United States of America are treated by primary care. And the vast majority of them are nurse practitioners or PAs. Okay? Thank God we got them. You see the bottom one is cardiologist. It's a sort of an understatement. And you might be able to see the one pixel on the bottom of that upside down pyramid. I'm making a joke. It doesn't exist. But that would be the pixel for guys like me, board certified advanced heart failure specialist. We, we don't even hit the triangle. Okay, this is the problem, and it's going to continue to grow. So how do we fix it? I told you already we're going to talk about facts, reality, and the future. Facts are this slide. This is a fact. This is reality. This is also a fact. Excellent guidelines. 2016 European guidelines, exceptional set of guidelines to treat patients with heart failure. 2013, updated in 2017, United States and Canadian guidelines also show how to treat it. Here's your recipe. Bake the freaking cake. Period. End of story. This should be a chip shot. All right? So why is it not a chip shot? Here you go. CHAMP HF trial. CHAMP heart failure trial. Published in Journal of American College of Cardiology, the Bible of Cardiology, Jack, 2018, July. And here's what it said. 3,500 plus or minus patients with heart failure, systolic heart failure, or what we call heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Heart doesn't squeeze no more. 150 primary care doctors and cardiologists put them together. A third of them are not on an ACE inhibitor, ARB, or neprilysin inhibitor. You got to be on one of them. You got to be on one of them. And this is not people who are allergic to it. I'm talking about you're not allergic, you got a busted heart, and you need a drug. A third of them won't even put on that. Another third of them won't put on a beta blocker. Ridiculous. Two-thirds of them are not on mineralocorticoid antagonism. I mean, are we really trying? So when you look at it, so a patient with HFREF should be on these three drugs, period, end of story. They should be on these three drugs. So how many of them were on? Only 25% of patients were receiving one of the three drugs at least at some dose interval. How many of them were on the right drug at the right dose for the right reason? In 2018, Less than 1%. That is not a typo. you got to get up in the morning and say, I'm going to suck pretty freaking bad to do worse than that. Period. The health care forum yesterday, you want to fix hospitals and all of that? That's where you got to fix medicine. you got to fix the provider. We suck. And I are one because I can bust them. If you say it, it's bad. If I say I'm a doctor, I can get on them. So 
So how do we fix it, guys? Here you go. Let's get fancy. Let's do some tech. $90 billion are going to be spent this year and next on development of tech. $59 billion of it in mobile health. $16 billion roughly on patient engagement. If they don't engage now, they ain't going to engage no better with an iPad, I can assure you. Healthcare management solutions, $16 billion. You're going to make me a better EHR, really? It's a global problem, and it is a problem. Here's the, here's the real problem, okay? I'm not techie, and I applaud you guys who are. You build me a better patient EHR, bring me some cool wearables, you bring me some cool implants. You saw that thing last month when Apple brought five cardiologists together and said, what do you think about the Apple Watch? And they said, we highly recommend you throw it in the trash. You come to my office, you get a 12-lead EKG. That's the standard of care. A one-lead EKG is not the standard of care. It's malpractice. I had a guy who came, a very wealthy attorney, came for me from the Cleveland Clinic as a second opinion after open heart surgery, two valves. He went to AFib and stroke from it. He came to me as a second opinion for a pre-transplant evaluation, had his Apple Watch on. He said, perfect. I put my 12-lead system on, open it up, AFib. Computer said AFib. Everybody recognized AFib. I said, Mr. X, what's that rhythm? He goes, that's AFib. Let's check your watch. Boop, normal sinus rhythm. Try it again, probably an error. Boop, normal sinus rhythm. You want that? I don't. It's not the fact that it missed it. It's the fact that it gave him a false sense of wellness. He's about to stroke, and Apple's telling him he's fine. That's a problem. Give me all the wearables you got, all the implants you got, all the mobile health you got, and I'm going to tell you, smash up against a brick wall until you fix the one problem that's going to be fixed with the Pulsario system. Meanwhile, your patients are waiting. Here's why. Okay? Let me take you on a story. Let me bring you back. I'm a Cajun. i got to tell you a story. And it ain't a Boudreaux and Thibodeau, although I could throw some of those at you. Here's the deal. 25 years ago, I'm a patient. I live in a small town, and I get a sore throat and a fever one day. I know a doc in town. 25 years ago, I walk over there and knock on his door. Hey, doc, what? Got a sore throat, got a fever. What can you do for me? Hand writes me a script, and mocks the ceiling, gives it to me. I got to walk to the pharmacist, drive to the pharmacist, get my prescription filled. I take it. A couple days later, I'm ready for vacation. Life's happy. Everything's cool. Fast forward, 2019, what do you do? Sore throat, fever, you text your doctor or you put it in some EHR. It goes to him and he looks at it. Oh, sore throat, fever. Let me give Kevin some amoxicillin. I'm going to automatically push it to the pharmacist on my fancy EHR. Pharmacy is going to automatically text him saying your medicines are ready. Still got to go drive down there, pick up the pills and shove them down your throat. Two days later, ready for vacation. Great. Okay. Now. I tell you that story to tell you this one. What did we do different? We delivered things different. We, instead of pen and paper, we brought him data. We brought him data. And he gave us an output. Was it pen and paper? No. It was very techy, push forward, get everything done. Perfect. What didn't change in that scenario and what is not going to change tomorrow and the next day and the next day? The provider is the rate-limiting step of this whole process. If that guy goes to not put on a, a cheap drug and gives me the $5 million appeal drug, I'm going to increase the cost of health care. Okay? If he screws up and don't recognize that I have lymphoma and my lymph nodes are all jacked up and he just decided to throw some amoxicillin at me and I die a month later, my kids are going to Disney World because we finna be rich because liability is huge. Liability in medicine is huge. Okay? So what we have to change, my friends, is not data delivery. It's not how you get it to the doctor or the nurse practitioner or the PA. It's what they do with the information. If you don't think the provider is the rate-limiting step to medicine, you are out of your mind. I'll prove it. There's a lot of different factors that go to the decision that a doctor makes, whether or not he should run a test, should he give you a pill, should he give you whatever, or her, whatever. Social media, look, I see 40 patients a day in clinic. At least 10 of them come in with Dr. Google on their pocket. I just Googled, this is all you need to know about me. Here's the five diagnoses I got. Okay, what are we gonna do to fix them? Dr. Google. Look, I love Google. I mean, I really love, I, would, I wanna Google something right now. I just don't have the time. But social media is there, Dr. Google is there, lifestyles are there, people are fast, life is just so fast right now. 
Um, you don't believe me, go out west and they just chill out. Pharma, big pharma, you can't turn on a TV today and don't see a pill that makes you have diarrhea and one that stops it. One that makes your blood pressure go up, one make it go down. One make you sleep better, one to keep you up all day. Big pharma pushes that as hard. Then you have patient factors, your genetics, your DNA, how were you born, who's your daddy? You can't pick your parents, cannot pick your parents. What do you eat? The gut mi microbiome, you want to read some fascinating Research, go, go research but gut, the gut microbiome, okay? Socioeconomic status, did you get here on a jet or did you get here in a car? Did you get here on a bicycle? Time, doctors don't have any time. When I'm in the doctor's lounge in the morning, you know what we talk about? How the hell do we get rid of all this data? Because I don't have time to look at it. And if you send me 20 things every day on 20 patients, that's 400 things I gotta look at, one of them matter, one of them matter but I am liable for all 400, okay? Because you may not have cancer today, and you told me you had it on Dr. Google. 10 years from now, you go find yourself some cancer in your breast, and now you're gonna sue me, because 10 years ago, you Googled it, and you told me I had breast can you had breast cancer. You didn't have it then, 10 years later don't matter, but guess who runs the bill? Trust me, you wanna see a bill, you look at my malpractice insurance, I'll show you a bill, okay? All of these things feed into that provider's decision. Am I going to get sued? Can I get home quicker? Is this going to require me to make more rounds in the hospital? All these things go into a provider's decision. And that, my friends, is what dictates clinical outcomes, financial outcomes, and clinical outcomes, wellness of the patient. So now I need a hustle. Here's the differentiator. When we were born, we got put in motion. Object in motion tends to stay in motion. You get the whole deal. All right? Here's what you don't know. When you, I wish I had a pointer. Do I have a pointer? Yeah, look. LV pump. When your cardiac output goes down and your blood pressure changes, everybody in this room, when you stand up to go to the restroom in a minute, when you stand up, your cardiac output shifts, your blood pressure shifts, your pulse shifts. That is an adaptive move. If you don't do it, you're going to be on the floor. Perfect. What happens if it don't stop? If it don't stop, your blood pressure stays up, your heart rate stays up. Guess what happens? Your heart thickens up, falls apart, boom, you're on the floor. So you can be on the floor either in an adaptive situation or a maladaptive situation. And the reason that tech will never fix medicine is because tech doesn't know if I'm adaptive or maladaptive. Okay? When things get turned on, cytokines, chemoreceptors, adrenal perfusion mechanisms, sympathetic stuff, fight or flight response, adrenaline, norepi, dopamine, all that. When it gets turned on, you better have a way to shut it off or you're going to die. In heart disease patients, that mechanism is distraught. So you have to figure out whether you're adaptive or maladaptive. If you make a decision in medicine, you got to know, am I making a decision against maladaptation or am I making a decision to improve adaptation, to enhance the adaptation to recover the organism, the human being organism. I don't know what this is supposed to do. All right. So the innovation is prediction. Here you are over here at hospitalization times zero Back to zero on the green is time zero, 30 days before. We live in a world of four days, four days before you go to the hospital with a bad heart, okay? Four days before you start to have symptoms. And I don't care who you are in this room, when you wake up tomorrow morning and you got a little bit of a sore throat and you feel bad and you rolled around all night, you just say, well, you know what? I rolled around all night. I'm probably tired, probably because I didn't sleep well. I'm not used to my bed. You know, this is not my bed, all that stuff. You make excuses and you wait a day. You ain't calling nobody. You ain't calling me. A day later, you wake up and you're like, nope, this is something This is something going on for sure. Definitely got a sore throat. Definitely don't feel good. I'm definitely tired. If this keeps going tomorrow, I'm going to call my primary care doctor or whoever. Okay? That's human nature. Human emotion matters. I said it. Okay? So now we went from the fourth day before hospitalization to one day before hospitalization with a heart failure patient. They've been short for two days. Not sure about it. They don't want to go back to the hospital. They were just there. Then they give me one day. Call me on the phone. I can't breathe. My weight's up by five pounds. What do I do? Nothing. I can't stop you. One day with an oral medicine at your house ain't stopping you. You go to the hospital. No, you can't stop nobody. So what we got to do is we got to move down the curve. There are certain devices out there, like for instance, you may have heard of cardio mems. Cardio mems tries to find pulmonary filling pressures. Pulmonary filling pressure. Pulmonary filling pressure gives an alert, sends it to the heart doctor. The heart doctor makes a move. Why don't you know about the company now? Because the guy who invented it and got to be the CEO is now back pushing a bag in the market trying to get it going. Because 
They're making a move without knowing adaption, maladaption. They're making a move on something they don't know about. Okay? So we've got to move ahead. So where do we go from here? Here's where you go. Precision medicine. You have to be precise. You have to be at the individual. You have to know their DNA, pharmacologic, we talked about genetic testing and all of that. You got to have it. You got to know their lifestyle. You got to know their medical history. Machine learning, several types of machine learning. Supervised learning can tell you, it can predict readmissions in 30 days. That's awesome. And I'm a heart doctor. You tell me, I can predict who goes into heart failure in 30 days. Great. What do you want me to do about it? Oh, we don't do that, dude. We just predict. You know? Okay, why don't you predict that in the trash can for me real quick? Because it ain't doing me no good and nobody else no good. Neural networks and deep learning can actually differentiate the types of heart failure. I'll show you that in a second. Okay, and then what? Oh, we don't know, dude. We're just telling you got a lot more than you know. They got more than just a heart, half ref, half peth. There's actually three of them. Okay, what do you want me to do about it? I don't know, dude. That's, the, that's all we know. We just predict. Yeah, throw that in the trash. And then you got your reinforced learning. Kid drives a hot pot. It burns. Ow. They're going to try it one more time to be sure. Ow. They'll never do it again. The computer can do the same thing. All right? So big deal. Neural networks can show me. HEFREF, one, two, three. Actually, in our software system, we actually found there's seven subtypes of heart failure. So what do you have to have in advanced cardiology treatment? You have to have precision medicine. You have to have precision medicine. You have to have computer learning. You have to have medical intelligence. If there's a clinical trial that this drug is better than that drug, I don't know why you want to put the inferior drug back on the patient. It's stupid. Put the right drug on the patient for the right reason. That's medical intelligence. You have guideline therapy, what we call medical reality. And then you have this stuff over here, which is really sexy, something I'll tell you about in just 10 seconds probably. <laughs> Mixed medical reality. We take virtual reality, augmented reality, medical reality. We put it all in our system, and I can go from this stage anywhere in the world you want as long as you connect it, and I'll end up right in front of you, holoportation. I'm going to be right in front of you. I will examine you real time. We can do everything but shake hands because I'm a ghost, but I'm there in front of you. We can talk face to face. We see emotion. We see our facial features. We can get on one another today. That's a technology that exists today in our system. So what do you system? You have to have a future ready platform. To be a future ready platform, you have to have it all. This is a busy slide to understand it. And no, I don't make grandma use all of this trash just to be able to talk to me. But it's just to show you, you have to be complete. You have to have the ability to do holoportation. You have to have some simplified diagnostics. You have to have wearables. You have to use biosensors. You have to have remote capability. It has to be mobile. You have to do teleconferencing. You have to have voice over IP for somebody with rheumatoid arthritis who can't type. Yes, I understand. She could say, yes, Alexa, I know Dr. Corville told me to, Dr. Corville told me to take my pill from five milligrams to 10 milligrams. I answered yes. So we sent her an alert. Ms. Smith, change your five milligram to 10 milligrams. Do you understand? Yes or no? Yes, we record it in the system. She knows what to do. Then we send it to the pharmacy, email her primary care doctor. So a future-ready platform has to be all-inclusive. So we took this, and we did it to 400 patients. After we did a 200-patient trial, we did a 400-patient trial. And we did this with the use of mid-level providers. Yes, there was an MD involved, safety only. That was me, oversight. The nurse practitioners and the PAs, well, actually, in this case was a PA, they did everything. The computer assisted their medications. So what happened was... Um, we use the system. Patients were on, enrolled in a system. The system then generates alerts to the provider when there's a problem with the patient. Not when they're doing good, only when there's a problem. The provider sees them, and he opens a dashboard, and then the computer says, this is the drug the patient needs next. And they put the patient on that drug, and then the computer says, great, you did that. Now check a BMP in a week, which is like a lab work, and see them back in two weeks. And when you see them back in two weeks, here's what you need to do. And oh, by the way, here's their diet. Here's their stress relief mechanism. Here's their sleep uh, mechanism. Here's all the stuff that we need to do. Would you like me to email it to their email? Yes, I would. Send it. So it was able to use supervised and unsupervised machine learning and the precision medicine model, model to pre predict the diagnosis. We can tell in our system if you're going to get sick 10 days before you get sick, and then we stop you from getting sick. In this trial, we reduced hospitalization in the next year by 91%. And we did it by this. The artificial intelligence used computer-assisted medical titration. You don't need to know. You don't need me to say change the medicine from 5 to 10. The computer can do it on its own. 
90% of medicine is cookie book, cook, cook book, cookie cutter medicine. You don't need me to do that. I'm an interventional cardiologist at times. My hands need to be bloody. I'm a stent guy. If I'm not putting stents in you, I'm wasting my time doing blood pressure management. The computer can do it. In this scenario, we reduce hospitalization, rehospitalization. 23.7% is a national average. We got it down to 6%. In Europe, they have a 44% readmission rate in the one year post initial hospitalization. Ours was 8.7%. In the United States, we dropped 60.1% hospitalization down to 8.7%. This is below threshold, threefold better than the best, quote unquote, best system that's out there commercially available today. That enables every institution who has a penalty to completely remove penalty from that deal. The government spent $30 billion last year, the United States government, 30 billion would it be on unnecessary readmission for heart failure. This, this completes it. This, this system, when you take our database and sync it to Medicare, we would have saved Medicare $26 billion last year. So in conclusion, chronic heart failure and chronic cardiovascular disease is a complex set of tools that require, is required for adequate delivery. Heart, fail, heart failure and chronic cardiovascular disease models in the future must incorporate mid-levels. They are going to rule the roost. PAs and nurse practitioners rule the roost. My kid just graduated high school, wants to go to college, said, Dad, I want to be a doctor, then I ain't paying for it, okay? You want me to pay for something? I'll pay for you to be a software engineer, or I'll pay for you to be a nurse practitioner, because that's who's going to rule the world. Application of machine learning is both diagnostic and important, guys, and treatment opportunities for chronic cardiovascular disease. It's not enough to bring data to a provider. If it don't do something with the data, you ain't got nothing. It's useless. If there are any investors in here who are going to invest in a tech company that can't have actionable outcomes, don't waste your money, period. If you're a home health person, take note. Home health company, take note. I told you before, automated car, self-driving. Robot gets out, walks to the door, knocks on it. Drone flies in. Automated vending machine opens up. Teleconference. Mama, come over here because you got dementia and you can't remember. Come here, mom. Take these pills. The daughter is on the tele, on the video conferencing tool. Grandma walks over, takes the meds, sips them down. Great mom, love you. Thanks for taking your morning meds. Have a great day. Boop, drone out of there, on the shoulder, self-driving car, bam. Home health agencies no longer exist. You want to fix the problem with healthcare? Fix the problem with healthcare. Hospital problems we talked about yesterday. What's the major cost of hospitals? Hospitals. You want to get rid of a hospital. That's what we want to do. Medicine at home, okay? I admit heart failure patients all day long. They get admitted, they get Lasix in the morning, and breakfast. They pee for two hours, lay in bed, watch TV, get lunch. Watch TV, get supper. They can't wait for tomorrow morning. Blood work, Lasix, pee in a jug, breakfast, lunch, supper. Government gives us a DRG, five days, five days. You, they can do that for five days and then they gotta go, okay? What's the problem? Uh, antibiotics, you got an infection, you want an antibiotic in the morning, then you gotta wait 24 hours, get your antibiotic in the morning. If you don't think I can fly that to your door, take your blood, be these microscopic blood draws, give you the medicine you need, and come back here. Well, you gotta be in the hospital to have, you know, all of the technical stuff. I just showed you the patch. I put a patch on you. I got a six lead EKG. I got everything I need to know about you. Heart rate variability, thoracic impedance measurements, changes in heart rate, changes in blood pressure, O2 saturation. I can tell you if you're apneic, I don't need you to be in the hospital. I need you to get the pills you need in the comfort of your own home, eating your own stinking food, right? I don't need to pay a hospital to babysit you. So that's what we do. That's the future of medicine. That's the future of cardiovascular care, and it's not coming in 2030. It's available now. You can have it. Thank you all for your time and attention. Oh, so my marketing person would be mad at me if I didn't show you this. How can a cardiologist be in two places at once? Pulsario is the answer, and life is why. Thank you. I'll take questions if anybody... Very good. Have a nice day. <laughs>